Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Helen Bertwistle and I'm going to be chairing this session. This session is entitled, What is a Good Death? Can Science and Medicine Tell Us? And we have a really excellent panel of speakers who are going to be presenting their ideas on what is undoubtedly a difficult question. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce them and then we're just going to get straight, straight on into to the discussion. So our first speaker at the end there is Jules Montague. Um, Jules is a consultant urologist at the Royal Free Hospital and an honorary consultant urologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. She writes regularly for The Guardian and The Independent, and much of her recent writing has focused on brain death and the challenges of predicting survival, um, both very important components of the debate today. And she wrote a fascinating article that features in, in the session's reading, so that's well worth following up later um, if you have the time. Our second speaker um, is Chrissy Giles, who specialises in writing, commissioning and editing long-form features. She's the commissioning editor at the Wellcome Trust open access publication, Mosaic. And she does a lot of work on biology, medical topics, and has a particular interest in palliative and end-of-life care. Again, really excellent article featured on the Battle of Ideas website. Um, very touching article. So I recommend you, you read that too. So welcome, Chrissy. Third to speak um, is Richard Smith. He's the chair of two health organisations, ICDDRB, formerly known as the International Centre for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh, and also another organisation called Patients Know Best. He was formerly the director of the United Health <coughs> Chronic Disease Initiative and the editor and chief executive of the British Medical Journal. He also wrote a very interesting article, again, it features on the Battle of Ideas website, which caused a real media storm. Um, fascinated to, to, to read about. So that's one of the many reasons that he's here um, to discuss the issue with us today. And finally, we have Kevin Yule at the end there, who researches and teaches the intellectual history of the US. Kevin has recently written a book, a very, very important book uh, for this discussion, Assisted Suicide, the Liberal Humanist Case Against Legalization. So our speakers um, are um, going to just give a, a, a brief overview, five minutes to put their, their ideas forward, and then we're going to come pretty much straight out to the floor for discussion. So Jules, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. So I'm a neurologist, as you've heard, and a writer as well. And I'm going to start with the, the story of Al McGrathy, who you might have heard of. So he was the convicted Lockerbie bomber and was sentenced to life in prison in a Scottish prison, actually. And it transpired pretty early in his time there that he was diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer. And as a result, a bunch of doctors were brought along and they were asked, how long is this man going to live? And they all disagreed, of course. But the consensus that was taken on board was that he had three months to live. And on the basis of that, he was actually released on compassionate grounds and went back to Libya. When he got there, he didn't just live three years, actually. He managed two years, nine months, which was obviously very controversial. Um, and the truth is, prognosis can be very uncertain, which is, is what I'm talking about. And yes, maybe when the end is near and the pain is too much, I can understand people saying no more ke chemotherapy, no more radiotherapy, no more experimental treatments. But the question is, when do you say that? When is too soon to say that? And I guess my concern is that as we're being swept up in this Gowande in particular, good death narrative, that maybe me as a hospital doctor and my colleagues will give up on you too early. So let me tell you the hardest thing about my job. Um, you've heard the hospitals I work at. Um, and I'm called into the intensive care unit uh, with other neurologists. And we're asked to figure out how long someone has to live. So let's say someone's been in a cardiac arrest or they've had a stroke, car crash. I'm asked to go in there and figure out, are they going to live? how long they're going to live for, and will they be able to walk or talk? And you can imagine that is really difficult. So I look at the scans, I look at the blood tests, I check people's reflexes, I shine a light in your eyes. And sometimes it's pretty straightforward, but a lot of the time that crystal ball is really, really hazy. So if I tell you you've got a one in a million chance of making it, you could be that one in a million, and you haven't sort of defied the odds, you've actually lived the prediction. So given that uncertainty, I'm concerned, as I said, about this narrative of good death, if we're not even sure 
when someone is going to die, if they're going to die imminently. So that's my first concern, I think. My second point is this idea of the train of good death. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Once you start thinking, oh, I'm going to go down the road of a good death, my concern is about choice. So once you opt out of the hospital system and you head into the hospice system, that means you won't hear from me, right? So I won't ring your GP or I won't write to your family. I won't contact you. And I'm guessing for some of you, that's exactly what you want. You don't want to hear from me at all. But if we're talking about choice for good death, then that means maybe your choices are going to be limited because we don't really have a system, I guess, whereby the hospital system and the hospice system feed in well enough. That's my concern. So that means if a new drug comes along or a new procedure, we might not let you know about it. You might not be aware. And I'm not talking about miracle treatments that we might hear about, and I'm not talking about really invasive, nasty treatments. I'm talking about something that might just give you a few extra months with less side effects. So Al Megrahi, who I mentioned, who was the, the Lockerbie bomber and went to uh, Libya, he received a prostate cancer drug that was not available in this country at the time, but was available in Libya. And that is now available here. You can get it on the NHS through NICE. It's not, it's not an issue to get it now. So in other words, if you'd made your good death decision in December 2011, you wouldn't have known about that drug, uh, and now you would. I want to end by talking about a research study that I think is really interesting and relevant. Um, so there's been this work in Cambridge over the last few years, led by a guy called Adrian Owen. And they've looked at patients in vegetative states. So these are people, again, car crashes, strokes, cardiac arrests. And they end up in hospital, and they're just lying there. So there's no response, no awareness, nothing. Maybe some grimacing, but they don't grip your hand or anything like that when you ask them to. And what he did was he placed these patients in functional MRI scanners. So he took a 23-year-old, and she'd been in a car crash, and she'd been in this state for five months with absolutely no response at the bedside. And when she was in that scanner, he asked her to imagine she was playing tennis. And this woman, who had shown no response whatsoever, the front of her brain lit up on that scan. And exactly the same part of the brain, the SMA, that would light up if you or I were asked to imagine that we were playing tennis. Same thing, he asked her to imagine she was navigating around the house, same bit of her brain, a uh, little bit further back, lit up. And I think this is an astonishing study. I mean, we thought these people, I thought these people, when I went into them in intensive care, that there was nothing in there, no awareness. It's huge, I think. Um, now, that doesn't mean that patients like this can go off and play tennis the next week or navigate around their home, but it means really we don't essentially know what we don't know yet. So if I could think of anything to, to conclude, I think really choice is a big deal here and we need to keep it open. I'm worried about this disconnect between the good life, good death. And I think it's, it's not a binary discussion. I think if you go down the road of good death, you've always got to have your choices open. You're always going to be allowed to change your mind. And you have to keep badgering us for information all the time. My feeling is if you get on the train of good death, if you want to, you should always be enabled, always be encouraged to pull the bell and get off at the next stop if you want to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was really useful, thanks. Chrissy, You want stories of my life, this woman said to me. Well, most of them are X-rated. It wasn't exactly what I expected to hear when I walked into a hospice. And I didn't actually get to hear any of her X-rated stories. But what I went to the hospice for was to basically do a creative writing group with people using the day hospice, which is the place where outpatients go. So everyone there had what was defined <clears throat> as a life-limiting illness. They would go there to do creative things, to check in with the nurses, to socialise. I was basically a stranger who turned up with a load of notebooks and some biros and sh sat them in a room and basically said, let's write some stories. And they didn't know me from anyone else, yet they were absolutely bursting to share their thoughts and feelings and their memories. So obviously talking to a room full of people who are living with really serious illnesses, I expected it to be a bit doom and gloomy, but that woman's initial comments really reflected the, the tone of the rest of my time there. We had lots of laughs, we had some tears, but really whatever I asked the, the people there to do, whatever exercise we came upon, you know, think about your childhood home, what would you do if you won the lottery, whatever we did, whatever they were really thinking about came out in their kind of responses. 
And one topic that came up again and again was frustration. So they were frustrated at what they saw as their own failing bodies. They were upset at letting people down. They were upset at the uncertainty and the fallibility and the bureaucracy of healthcare and the doctors and nurses treating them. Of course, there were worries about death. Uh, most commonly, these came out as kind of concerns about how they would leave their loved ones and how they would cope without them. And one woman was worried about her family taking her ashes back to the, ashes back to the Ganges. But even in this group of people who knew they were likely to die from an illness or a condition sooner than, say, you or I, there were still some conversations about end of life and death that weren't happening. And I don't think my experiences has told me anything about what makes a good death, but I think there are a few things that could lead to a less good death. Um, there's kind of research showing that avoiding conversations about end of life with people who have serious illnesses can lead to them having aggressive and potentially useless treatment in their last weeks and days. It can also mean people don't have their wishes heard or responded to, so maybe you don't want to be resuscitated. Maybe you don't want to be resuscitated in certain conditions. But if people don't ask, then they don't know. And I also think that it doesn't give people the time to get their affairs in order. So they may want to do a few simple things. They may want to write a letter. They may want to just ask somebody to do something for them. If you're not being honest with them about what you think might happen, because, of course, no one can actually know, you're denying them that chance. And I think if somebody brings up these difficult conversations, it gives the patient and their loved ones a chance to kind of decide how much they go into it more or how much they don't. I mean, do you know what your partner or your parent or your sibling's view on organ donation is? Do you know what music they want at their funeral? I thought I'd now just read a little bit from one of the sessions I did at the hospice with patients. Everyone got a post-it note and they had to write just a single word on it that meant something to them over the last week. And uh, we then discussed what those words might mean. Frustration, fall, enough. The single words written on post-its told their own story. Guncho spoke about her choice of word, talking about regrets, the eternal struggle to avoid rose-tinting the past. Yvonne regrets the drinking that caused her disease. Margaret was no nonsense, saying she wouldn't change a thing. Whatever we start with, it always comes back to the illness. With clarity as keen as a razor, Guncho sums it up. She knows that she isn't accepting of her situation, and she knows that she can't be. How can anyone not in that situation understand? Regrets are like the rain, she says. Although we need some rain, it is always unwelcome when it comes. What smell would your chosen word be? What weather? <coughs> what animal? The smell of human feces, rotting things, a hurricane, a caged animal, a fierce tiger. One woman picks the meerkat from the insurance company adverts. She likens the recent ad where he has to jump through a flaming hoop on a motorbike to her attempts to keep her family happy. Frustration comes up again and again at the failing of bodies to work and to have the energy to do what you want them to. The pressure of having to behave in a particular way for relatives. The lack of listening, respect and response from people working in healthcare. John has a neurological condition and finds talking very difficult. He took the nurse in the room with him and pointed at various bits of equipment until she pieced the story together. He had had a fall in the week and now there were discussions about whether he should be in a wheelchair full time. Others responded to John's story. We're all on a decline. That's where we're all going, isn't it? We're all heading for the wheelchair bit eventually. Someone comments on the better weather, yet sunny and hot isn't always a good thing, bringing swollen legs, worsening agoraphobia, and reminding people of holidays past. Margaret tells me that she could have done anything with her life, gone to university, whatever, but all she ever wanted to do was have a family. <coughs> she's just met her newborn sixth great-grandchild, but can't hold her yet because of the chemo she's been having. Should we warm up the same next time, I ask as we wrap up. No need, the group says. There's not enough time for that. We just want to get on with it. Thank you, Chrissy. What is a good death? Can science and medicine tell us? And it can't. And I mean, science and medicine are not set up to tell people what is a good death, just as they're not set up to tell people what is a good life. I mean, that's much more a question actually for philosophers and for each of us individually. Just as there are many ideas of what's a good life, so there will be many ideas of what's a good death. Uh, I mean, medicine and science can't even tell us what health is. Uh, if you look at a medical textbook, it might be 2,000 words long. There are 990 pages on disease described laboriously, and then there are about 10 pages on health, usually written by a philosopher. <laughs> I mean, the only definition we have that people play around with is the WHO definition, which it is complete physical, mental and social well-being. And the joke is the only time you ever reach that is at mutual orgasm. Otherwise, we're unhealthy all the rest of the time. 
But science and medicine can help us live longer. But even that isn't necessarily a success, because although in this country we are living longer, as in most high-income countries, actually the period of unhealthy life is growing faster. So we're spending longer and longer in unhealthy life. And is that a good thing? It doesn't seem to me that it is. That's not a great success for medicine. Uh, and similarly, once we've decided what a good death is, then potentially medicine and science can help us achieve it. So probably quite a lot of people would say, I prefer a pain-free death, although by no means everybody. And if that is the case, then morphine and various other technologies can help. And I think one of the great scandals of the world is that in much of the world, morphine, a very simple, very cheap, very effective drug, is simply uh, not available. But even there, you know, a lot of we, we, we might think of pain as a physical thing, but of course there's psychic pain, which I think is much, a much worse problem in a way, and I'm not at all sure that medicine can deal with that. So I ought to tell you why I'm here. It's because of this sort of scandalous article I wrote. Uh, I wasn't really imagining that I was doing that. I was sat uh, between Christmas and New Year, and I was reading an essay about Louis Bunuel, the Spanish filmmaker, and how he'd always thought he wanted to die suddenly, but then he you know, sat with a friend who was dying, and uh, actually they talked, and just as Chrissy was describing, had all kinds of good times and laughed, and he suddenly thought, well, maybe I don't want to just go like that. I'd rather go more slowly. So I thought, well, that's an idea I'm kind of familiar with, so I wrote this piece, imagining I was just writing it for sort of 10 people who would read it in the BMJ. But in fact, the Daily Mirror picked it up. Top doctor says uh, cancer is the best way to die, which is a sort of, um, you know, it's a classic man bites dog story and maybe nothing else was going on. It literally reverberated around the whole world in a rather extraordinary way, much more so than anything else I've ever written. <laughs> and, I mean, I'm a pro-death guy. I mean, I think death is a great thing. And the sooner, you know, that, well, not actually the sooner we die, but... Because <laughs> my core argument is that without death, every birth would be a tragedy. And, I mean, we are hovering on the edge of that right now. And for me, death gives life meaning, gives it a shape, rather than just going on forever. There is nothing worse than the idea of immortality. Anyway, in my article, I said there are essentially four ways to die. And I'd like to give you a choice now. I'll quickly run through what they are, and then you can tell me what you'd like. So one is sudden death. That's about less than 10% of deaths. One is the long, long, slow death of dementia and frailty, which is rapidly becoming the commonest. Uh, a third is organ failure, whether it's heart failure, respiratory failure, kidney, where you kind of go down and you keep having these dips and you don't know which is the one that's going to finish you off. And then there's cancer, where you kind of bang along and then usually when it comes to kind of dying, you go over about three months or so, you know, in weeks or months, not years. And, of course, in this country, that's what will get you into a hospice where it might be uh, uh, deluxe dying for the few looked after by dowager duchesses, was how we once <laughs> described what goes on in hospices. But, unfortunately, most people don't get to experience that. So those are your choices. So who'd like to die a sudden death? That's most of you. Who'd like to die from dementia and frailty? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, oh, no, two. Oh, why? Who'd like to die from organ failure? No. Nobody. Well, who'd like to die from cancer? Oh, yeah, well, it's interesting. Well, a lot of seem you don't want to die at all, and I kind of <laughs> understand that. But actually, of course, you know, that... I was trying to make a serious point. I think there is a lot to be said for having a chance to say goodbye. And those of you that have watched... You know, the, the, the uh, Dennis Potter interviews, you know, the things that people... I mean, as you get near the end of life, actually, it suddenly enhances life in a way that he describes terribly beautifully. But, of course, the reality is we don't choose how we're going to die unless, of course, we're going to choose for assisted suicide, which will lead neatly into Kevin. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Kevin. Nice to be known for such things. I would say that a good death is a moral or existential issue. It is not a medical issue, as, as Richard started to say. And I think thinking of it in medical terms is probably not the best thing. I think there is, there's a current mania about death. There's this idea, for instance, that I've heard a lot about where we don't talk about death and we need to talk more about death. And I'm 
getting a bit sick of that because everybody's telling me that. So everybody is talking about talking about death. Um, you have death cafes, death studies, macabre body world of Gunther von Hagen. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the, Richard mentioned a three-day death festival, uh, which, which I think would probably be the best way to go if, if you could actually. But, but um, you, and you even have goths, like, my, you know, I have a child, it's a goth. And, and, and you kind of think there's this great celebration of, of death in some ways. It, it's almost, it, I think it's an underlying uncomfortability with death. And, and it, it's trying to face it, whistle in the dark, if you like, or even embrace it. Uh, whereas I, I think Epicurus has some interesting ideas. He's, Epicurus said, death does not concern us because as long as we exist, death is not here. And when it does come, we no longer exist. So I, I think what the, the real crisis that's underlying this is a crisis in meaning of life. I think it's a, it's a philosophical kind of issue. Uh, there's no sense of the past and future that within which our lives and deaths might be understood. And the problem's very aptly described in Christopher Lash's Culture of Narcissism, uh, about the ravages of age, but apt about death anxiety as well which he said uh, the usual defenses against the ravages of age, identification with ethical or artistic values beyond one's immediate interests, intellectual curiosity, the consoling emotional warmth derived from happy relationships of the past can do nothing for the narcissist. And Lash points to the insecurity of our age, uh, of a narcissistic age, where we're, we're unable to see beyond ourselves, where the world is a mirror rather than something bigger or something to conquer. Um, and in the past, I, I had an elderly relative that said to me, uh, death isn't the end of the world. That was her sort of line. And uh, it, she made a good point where, you know, there's, there's sort of a lack of spiritual center in some ways today that I think gives us no understanding of death, which is, of course, just simply a polar negative, really, of, of uh, life in many different ways. So it's, it's people aren't able to understand their lives, and therefore death becomes a big sort of existential crisis. And um, so a lot of people despair that one's death is actually the end of the world. Um, in religious terms, the eternal death that's talked about. Uh, but there's also a sort of cultural backdrop with a message of terminus. There are storm warnings, portents, and hints of catastrophe really do haunt our times. And I think it's that context that creates the whole anxiety about death. I think one place that Gawande was, was right about is to point to the medicalization of death. And I think that is a problem. Um, I think we, we medicalize death. Uh, it's seen in technical terms. And uh, I think this is something that's gone on. I mean, I, I'm a historian, so I'm looking at this. So if anybody wants to know about this, I can, I can do chapter and verse, if you like. Um, but it's really a post-war problem. And it's something that has changed in about 1970. So, in 1970, people started realizing that we were medicalizing death and that this was a big problem, but they continued to medicalize death. And one of my criticisms of assisted suicide is that it, it puts um, death as a medical treatment. And I think that um, can be a, a, a real problem. It, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, sort of, it's not appropriate to have death as a medical treatment. I think, it's, as I say, it's a moral or existential problem. So what's a bad death? I think a senseless destruction of life, rejection of life, uh, death of as, as a cure for life's ills, a counsel of despair, a death that disturbs those left behind. Because let's face it, those are the people that count in remembering a bad death. I remember my grandfather's bad death, uh, but he doesn't. It, it's not him suffering. It's, it's worth sort of keeping in mind the perspective that we have um, on these things. One that for the bereaved it sears itself into memory and contradicts our memory of uh, who that person was. What's a good death? Um, I have some sympathy for Richard's position in the sense that I think a, a good death is, is one that we're, we have time to prepare for in many different ways. It's not sudden. It's like the end of a novel. It's not, you know, you're able to resolve issues. A good death is where the person dying does their utmost to retain their personal qualities. And strangely enough, humor uh, seems to help because it cuts through the gloom and hopelessness and it gives you, it lightens a moment and in recollection, you can actually smile as well as have tears. Thank you all very much. There's an awful lot there on the table. I mean, really interesting 
um, perspectives from you all. I mean, there's the, the medicalization of death that we've just heard about, the individual experiences of death, what the doctor's role within um, death actually um, is, as well as, of course, of assisted suicide, which was something that Kevin only just mentioned at the end. So you might well decide, panel, that you want to come back on, on one another as well. But for now, I think we'll just go straight out to the audience for some questions from, from them. I suppose the distinction that I'd like to make is between death and dying, because I've witnessed uh, somebody dying in America and uh, he cancer, um, and every symptom of his dying was treated as though it was curable. So that, you know, the idea that death is... Cu we can cure it, and we can't. So he was constantly being intervened and offered new drugs, and, you know, each thing cost $4,000, and then he had to decide whether he was going to have more chemo. And, and eventually, the dying became uh, a torture of indecision and fear and, and nobody allowing you to say, you are, you know, you're dying. The, you know, these aren't symptoms. This isn't a disease. This is dying. And I found it really shocking. And it worries me as a woman, you know, coming into my you know, 70s, that is that what's there for me? I, I want a choice about the dying, not the death. I'd like to uh, take up Kevin's position, which in many ways I appreciate it very much. I agree with you entirely that death is a moral issue. It's an existential issue. I found it very strange, therefore, when you voiced your opposition to assisted dying, and you called it assisted dying was a medicalized strategy. I don't think it's a medicalized strategy at all. In fact, I think one of the problems with medicine, and I speak from experience as well as thinking about this, is that the patient is often made a passive recipient of the treatment. <laughs> you put yourself in the hands of the doctor, the doctor will tell you what to do. This, I think, is a not a good strategy for survival or for health. It's very important, I think, to encourage patients to be active, to be agents themselves. And this is exactly what assisted dying is. I think the extraordinary thing about assisted dying, if you're facing very difficult health issues, it gives you a sense of control over your life and your death. And that is enormously exhilarating. And I think to take it away is actually to medicalize the person who's trying to seek death at their own hands. It's actually to make them passive. It's actually to make them a child again. My question's a technical question, really, I think. You've, um, <laughs> a couple of you talked about the hospice movement and the relationship between the NHS and palliative care and how you choose to leave, you, you leave that if you go into the hospice movement. I think that's very confusing mm. and difficult for people to understand. And I wonder if you'd make any comment on that because I think that that may feed into people's concerns and fears around end-of-life treatment in this country. I was brought up a good Catholic boy. I'm not a good Catholic boy anymore. But it struck me... Are you a bad one? one? <laughs> uh, almost certainly. Um, we all are. <laughs> but it, it did strike me you were a religion-free zone. <laughs> and when, when I'm with my very demented 88-year-old aunt, um, the only thing she talks sense about is what's going to happen to her. But, and, you know, do I think that there's life after death? And is there God? And it seems to me to be a very old conversation to be having without that being part of the conversation. Uh, maybe that's just because I a, was a good and now a bad Catholic boy, but it just seems weird to me. Um, it, it seems that the church, um, certainly the Catholic church, had its own form of... Uh, passage, its own sacrament, um, its own balm uh, at the moment of death. And it seems weird to me that we don't feature this in our conversation about it. OK, thank you very much. We will come back out. I'm going to give the, the panel just a chance to, to make some, some additional comments. I don't know, Jules, whether you want to focus on um, that question about the hospice movement or the de good death train that you mentioned, but just clarifying perhaps sure. a point about that. Um, I went to convent school, Catholic convent school in Ireland, so um, I knew I'd get into trouble. I got suspended from convent school as well, but they let me back in, and I never told my parents, so it's nice this is going to be on YouTube. Um, so I feel proud. I've done it, I've done it. Um, so... <laughs> so oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Um, so just just coming back to your, I think I'm really really glad because uh, 
I didn't put it all in the talk, obviously, because I hope someone would challenge me on it. Um, and I think in many, many places there's great links. And to be honest, a lot of people who go to hospices or opt out really want to opt out. They don't want to hear about this drug that might give them a couple of extra months. Um, and I think the strength of the palliative uh, approach is that people are asked that question when they get to hospice. So the choices are never out. But my concern is maybe we're not doing that across the board. I suppose that's the concern. And if I could just briefly come to your question, which was on this, the same thing. It, you know, you're, you're right. I think at some point it's, it's correct for some people to say no more chemotherapy and no more radiotherapy and not to be tortured. But the, the thing is that that's their choice. And I do have patients who will come to me and, and they want that extra few weeks. They want to go to their daughter's graduation. You know, they, they want to be sitting, sitting at, at their wedding maybe and they might be on a breathing machine, you know, they might have morphine hooked up, but that's their choice. And the danger is not asking. The problem is, of course, you can be paralyzed by choice if it's not given to you in the right way. So that's our responsibility to do that correctly. Okay, thank you very much. Chrissy? Yeah, I guess talking about the death and dying process, obviously I'm not an expert, nor do I have a medical degree, so hedge, hedging over. I say to the lady in orange, I mean, just... It, it's really on the patient and I guess the patient's family to make their wishes known as much as they can be. And it's like, don't wait for someone to be paralyzed in a car crash before you say, oh, we really never had that conversation. I mean, I spoke to Kate Granger, who's a doctor who has terminal cancer and she's doing a great job of getting people talking about death and dying more. And she was like, it's not like everyone's just gonna be queuing in the supermarket being like, so what are your wishes about death, Jules? Let me know. But you know, why not? It shouldn't be some, I mean, I'm not walking around like death, death, death. But if we don't talk about it, you know, we're not going to know what people want. And in all seriousness, you obviously can't say how you're going to feel about a situation until you're there. But that doesn't mean you can't sit down and have a conversation and be like, Look, I don't want you to die. I love you. I want you to be around for a long time. And I love being here. And I don't want to die either. If I am to die, please don't play James Blunt at my funeral. <laughs> I will come back and kill you and die again. Um, you know, other singers are available. But... I think in all seriousness, <laughs> if you don't make your wishes, if he dies now, I feel terrible. If you um, don't make your wishes known, then people haven't got the chance to act on them. But I think there's also a, a question around patients and relatives being kind of given the chance to understand what things mean. So Jules and I were talking earlier about this study in the States of cancer patients where they were talking to patients about who'd been offered palliative chemotherapy. So palliation is you know, the relief of suffering, and it doesn't exist to make people live longer or to cure you of disease, it exists to make your suffering less. But they did a survey and 60 plus percent of p patients with cancer who'd been offered palliative chemo were like, do you think this cancer might cure, this chemo might cure your cancer? Over 60 percent of them said yes. And whose fault is that? It's not the patient's fault. So I think we need to kind of engage with people more and be and it's so hard for doctors and people working in healthcare because they've got no time. You've got to have these conversations with a flimsy curtain between you. You know, someone's crying, someone else has just thrown up. It's not easy in the slightest, but everyone's kind of, you've really got to be on top of your own care and the care of the people you love. And I think it's really hard for doctors and healthcare and they do a brilliant job. But somebody somewhere has to just make sure people know what's going on. So I think it's really important. Um, and we're not all going to die in hosp hospices. And maybe that's not even the best, you know, that wouldn't be the best thing. Most of us are going to probably die in a hospital. Some of us are going to die at home. What it is more important than making hospices available to more people, I think, is making wherever people are going to die better places to die. So if you talk to a lot of people that work in specialist palliative care in places like hospices, it's brilliant because if you get there, thumbs up. And it really is that, you know, the kind of, they're amazing places. I went, the one I was at, you know, the hotel, it was like a hotel. It was like an all you can eat hotel. With that, you asked the chefs what, I mean, you were dying and that sucked. And in all seriousness, it was awful. But if I was gonna die anywhere, that would be where I'd wanna do it. But in all likelihood, that isn't gonna be where I end up dying. So wherever it's gonna happen, try and make those places better too. And I don't think we wanna have this like palliative care, you know, ivory tower they're experts but also all doctors have got a kind of and all healthcare workers will have to deal with this and i think medical students sometimes they come into the system and they don't realize they're dealing going to be dealing with death and dying they're kind of like oh let's bring in you know the death assistants they're like sorry guys this is all on you and ha i mean that to me that blew my mind when somebody told me that um so massive respect to everyone that has to deal with this stuff but i also think it's about making your wishes known but also making sure you kind of understand and not being afraid to ask and to have these, they're so hard, but have these conversations before it's too late. Okay, thank you. Right, I've got a quote for the uh, woman about death and dying. I've got a friend who's the president of the Institute for the Future, and he says, in Glasgow, where I was born, death was viewed as imminent. In Canada, where I trained, it was inevitable. In California, where I live now, it's viewed as optional. 
<laughs> and, un and unfortunately, I think the world is going in the California direction. And increasingly, people in the US die in intensive care. And I, don't, I can't imagine anybody here likes the idea of dying in intensive care, you know, with tubes everywhere, no privacy, God knows what. Um, and that's potentially the way we're going. Responding to the point about, you know, we should be in charge of our own health, that's exactly the way that healthcare has to go. And it's kind of peculiar, really, that we've got into a phrase that, you know, health essentially belongs to doctors and professionals. It doesn't belong to us. If you have meningitis, then what the doctors do will make the difference whether you live or die. If you have diabetes or the chronic conditions that most of us have now, it's what we do that makes the difference, not what the doctors do. So this sort of... And I would extend that to dying as well. There's a very famous study about... Uh, putting people going into hospices and palliative care, done in the US, actually, where the people... So they took people and some went on with, you know, curative treatment and some went for palliative care. And actually, the people who went for palliative care live longer, which, when you think about it, is not so surprising because a lot of the treatments that you're given to cure you actually kill you prematurely. And I pick up... I agree about the point about religion. And, I mean, the, this is where the medicalization of death is a problem, I think, because every, I mean, one of the fundamental culture questions that every culture has to answer is, you know, what is death? Why do we die? How should we die? How can we make sense of it? And religion was the main institution we had for doing that. But other cultures have many different kinds of explanations. And then according to Ivan Illich, and I think he's right, along came medicine saying, don't worry about that. We can fix disease. We can fix pain. We can stop death if you give us enough time. And it's all a lie. It's all wrong. And so you're left kind of <laughs> stranded. And so I think re-understanding cultural mechanisms, bringing death back into life, that's why I think that is important, that we do need to talk much more about death. And I think, although there's, lot, I agree, death is the new fashion, it's the new black, at the same time, all the evidence is that most ordinary people, maybe not the people in this room, are not having conversations about death uh, so I think that is something we need to do fundamentally. We do need to demedicalize death because leaving it to doctors is a bloody bad way to do it. OK, thank you. Um, so, Kevin, you were asked specifically about assisted suicide and how far, you know, was this not an example of patients exercising control and autonomy at, at the end of their, their lives? I think, first of all, it is suicide, the way it's at least projected in at least the, the uh, legislation that's proposed. It is essentially taking poison um, with, a, you know, the same poison that's used to, to kill people in, in uh, capital punishment cases in, in the United States. So it is taking poison in order to kill yourself. And so it is suicide. It's not... It, the assisted dying always annoys me because I think it's just dishonest. I, I think it's just avoiding... It's a euphemism in the same in the way that so many things are euphemistic in the whole discussion about death and life. Uh, so it is suicide, and do we need a doctor to do that? I would argue that suicide is an act that we can do ourselves, and I think that that is it. You know, it's anybody who has access to this little thing called the internet and uh, a few chemicals can actually manage this very well. And people were doing it even before then on their own, and I think. What I see the assisted suicide movement is doing is trying to medicalize that, trying to make it the property of doctors rather than actually um, leave people to be completely autonomous. And, uh, of course, suicide is completely legal. Um, rather than leaving them to do it themselves, then they are providing an assistance, um, you know, almost to, to, to give the proverbial man on the bridge a push. And I don't think it's necessary. And I think that's why I argue that actually assisted dying, assisted suicide, whatever you want to call it, is a medicalization of suicide. OK, I'm sure there'll be um, plenty of questions. So, hello. Um, I'm involved in leading the campaign on assisted dying. Hello, Kevin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, and um, Sarah. Sarah Wooden's my name. And um, I, I think that this is... that assisted dying is absolutely not about suicide. Suicide is about people who want to end their lives. Assisted dying is about people who are dying, who want to have control over their deaths. 
people who have an assisted death would love to live. This is something that Brittany Maynard said in the US. And of course, California has recently, just last week, legalized assisted dying, which means that over 50 million Americans will have the choice of an assisted death. So why haven't we got one here? And the whole point is that what Brittany said is, I want to live, but I can't live. I'm dying, so I want to control my death. I also run a, a charity called Compassion in Dying, which um, helps people in a way how to talk about death, because a lot of the panel have said we should talk more about death. Well, how do we talk about death? And Atul Gawande said, talk about the reality of dying when dying becomes the issue for you. And I would say that when dying does become a reality for you, you need to have an advanced decision or a living will. You need to make out a lasting power of attorney. You need to tell other people what your wishes are. And they go much more, deep, much more deeply than where you want to die. They're about what kind of treatment you want, how you want to die. And putting that down, having that conversation is so important. It's not just actual dying that we're trying to deal with, it's the anxiety around dying. So knowing you have the choice of an assisted death. Over 40% of people in Oregon who have the prescription to have an assisted death don't take it. Just knowing they've got the option is enough. And isn't it important that we treat the, or help people with that anxiety? The, the study that you mentioned, which is by the Institute of Medicine around palliative care, um, giving people the options and actually people, patients in palliative care living longer, is actually very, very hard to find online. And so one of the issues, I think, with medicine is that those kind of informations, which actually would give you a much more round um, way of thinking about death and what the, op what the options in the medical context of it are actually hidden. Before I came in here, I sort of, my feeling is I'm very much on the Atalgwande side of things that we over-medicalise um, death, etc. But actually kind of listening to some of the things that the panel has said today, I think we need to be a bit careful mm. about giving all the choice and power to the patients and their families. Because from my own personal experience, when you find yourself in these situations, you need information and you need expertise and you need support. So you might not need medicalization of the dying process, but you need someone to explain to you what that might involve. Um, and, and as this lady's just said, that information is often very, very hard to find. So I think there is a halfway house here between not expecting too much from the medical profession, but there is some onus there for them to use their expertise and to share that with you so you know what you're facing. Uh, hello, I'm Rex. I've been looking after um, patients who've been dying, mainly of cancer and HIV, for about 30 years, 40 years. And um, a, a brief comment first, and then a question. Um, comment is that um, I think the, the difficult to define quality of kindness and care must always be uh, able to be applied to a patient or someone who's ill. And I'm concerned that those qualities and that uh, are not always applied at the end of someone's life and I think we must always think of what is the kindest thing to do and what is the most caring thing to do, provided we also give treatment if needed for a disease. So being a doctor requires lots of things. But for um, assisted dying and care at the end of life, I am surprised that uh, we haven't been creative enough to find amongst our midst um, a new profession. <laughs> Why would it be doctors? Why would doctors like myself suddenly have to learn a new skill after 50 years of ending someone's life when we've actually, or assisting them to end, when we've been trying to help them with their symptoms and their illness for the rest of their life? Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't know what an IT consultant would be, but we've got val a valid new profession. Let's look to see who can um, be at the interface of the dying patient, have some creative people who won't be part of the care team, and let's give them a name. This may be an infantile remark or question. Does anybody in the panel had experience of somebody who died happy? And how did they die happy? And can I do it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite like to die a sudden death. I don't think I'd like that for my loved ones. Maybe a long and slow and painful one for my enemies. Uh, I suspect when I die, um, I will be thinking a lot more about the impact. Well, I may be thinking about the impact on others as much as myself. My question to the panel is, what's a good death for those who are not dying? Okay, thank you. 
Kevin made the point that a good death is one that doesn't disturb those left behind. I'd just like to give a brief um, illustration from my work as a genetic counsellor where some patients face a 50% risk of an early onset adult degenerative conditions like early onset dementias or Huntington's disease. One of the patients I worked with that had most difficulties deciding what to do and was most disturbed about her situation was the one whose mother had taken her life at Dignitas as soon as she'd found out her situation. And she felt that that was the path that she should follow, um, that was what you did in her family after that, and that you shouldn't be a burden. That's the burden. I'd like to die happy. I'd like to get the fame and fortune uh, because I insist on my full independence, I will not be cared for. I can either be a suicide bomber, I could go to the man-eating lions, or you could advise me how much whiskey I need to drink per stone of weight. I want the fame, my nieces will get the fortune. <laughs> OK, we'll come back to the panel again, a lot, to, a lot on the table there. Richard, do you want to start? I mean, how many people in this room have a living will or an advanced directive? You see, you ought to have, because, you know, dying, you like, me like to think it's a long way away, but it may not be. You could be dying this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow. So you need an advanced directive, and we all need one, not just people who are late in life. I absolutely agree. When I'm, I'm a great... I was on the board of the Public Library of Science, which is about making all scientific studies available to everybody everywhere for free to reuse. And that movement, slowly but surely, is gathering momentum. So everything that's funded by the National Institutes of Health in the US, which is about a quarter of medical research, has to be open access within uh, six months. I like the idea that, I mean, doctors are obviously in the business of giving information, but just as the man, uh, the doctor at the back said, I think there's every reason why, just as we have midwives who help us through birth, there could be another group of people, not doctors, uh, who could help people through the whole process of death and dying. The awful thing is we don't really know the quality of dying in this country. I mean, ironically, we just came out top in a world survey, as you probably saw in The Economist. But we don't really know. We know what people die of. We know where they die, and that's often used as a surrogate for the quality of dying, but it's a very poor surrogate. I think we need much better data on how people die, because my suspicion is a lot of people die badly. Do I know anybody who's died happy? Well, I know, I can think of some, actually, where I've been talking to them just before they died, and they were very kind of attuned to it, they were ready, weren't necessarily happy about it. But I think of, I always talk, think of my parents. I mean, my father died at 81, having been at the Battle of El Alamein when he could have had a, there was a 50% mortality, smoked all his life. He never thought he'd get to 81. He died magnificently, you know, at home, no morphine, just said, OK, I've had enough, off he went. Whereas my mother, you know, has spent the last nine years with no short-term memory. I go and see her every week. We have good conversations. But it's, I don't think it's really what she wanted to happen to her. And she could go on for another five, ten years. So I think, you know, that's why I think my father died of renal cancer. It can be a very good way to die. OK, thank you very much. Chrissy. Uh, oh, there's so much, my brain is exploding. Um, <laughs> so the, the lady who has issues looking for scientific papers... Hi, that's my day job. Um, it's really hard. Um, open access is an amazing thing, like Richard said. Wellcome Trust also requires all the authors to make their papers open access within six months. Um, but seriously, uh, going on Twitter and asking people to send you papers is probably not completely legal. I could not suggest that at all. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but in all seriousness, this kind of idea that information belongs to the people, you know, it really belongs to everyone who's funding it, and a vast majority of research is somehow publicly funded, and if it isn't, it's funded by charities who are kind of passionate about sharing it. And I think that kind of leads on to the second stripy lady's point about kind of the help or expectation from people about what dying looks like. So personally, I remember an experience where somebody was imminently dying. We didn't know, how would we know? It sounded ridiculous, but how would we know? And somebody just sat us down and said, you may see these things. These things might not happen. This might be that. Don't panic. And literally just having a five-minute conversation with somebody, it's like we just hired a car in America. It was, you know, left hand. It was automatic. We didn't know what we were doing. Someone sat down for five minutes and just went, don't do this, do this. It will be fine. And I don't mean to sound glib about it, but just having someone who's seen this a thousand times, you know, and for medical staff and healthcare staff to remember that, you know, you've probably seen this hundreds of times. For this person, it might be their first death. It might be, hopefully, one of very few that they see. 
Um, so being having someone around who can help, and that's why hospices are so good, but also I think there's excellent care in other places. So I think, yeah, sometimes just kind of people trying to remember that other people have not seen everything they have, and no matter who you are or where you are, making sure that you can ask. And it's really hard, but it, it's possible. Just about that point about... Uh, not being able to find the article, I echo what everyone said. If you Google palliative paradox, I found lots of stuff that came up on that topic. So just a practical point. Um, I remember writing an article, I better not name it, for a, a decent neurology journal, and I wrote it, and I couldn't get access to it without paying 40 quid. So it does, it does happen. Um, in, terms, in terms of uh, doctors and dealing with death and how much experience we have, the first, the first ever on-call I did in Ireland as a 23-year-old the first thing I had to do when my bleep went off was to see a man about issues with ejaculation. That was the first thing. And the second thing is I was, I was called to pronounce someone dead and I'd never done it. And there's this Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine and I actually had to leaf through the book to see how to do it. So the shining the light in the eyes and all of that. I mean, that was a long time ago. I hope things are better taught now. I want to come back to uh, the two stripy top people, if I could call you that. Um, and there was a thing about anxiety around advanced directives. So my research in Ireland, I drove around for three years and I saw patients with motor neuron disease. And I sat in their homes and I met their dogs. Um, I met their families as well. And I, I followed them up until they passed away. And it was great because most doctors work in a clinic room, we hand out the prescription, and we never see people again. And every Friday, I would get a list of whoever had died, and it was absolutely devastating. It's, it still upsets me now. And one of the things I had to discuss with it was advanced directives, and I actually found that I was more anxious about discussing them than them. This was something, you know, I hadn't given enough credit to people, quite frankly. You know, people have thought about this <coughs> stuff. We might be the one to mention it first within the medical world, but, but that's all. Um, so I hope that kind of goes, goes some way. I think people are more capable than I'd given them credit for. Um, the final question was how to die happy, which was a nice, easy one. Um, again, with the patients I saw with ALS, everyone was different, but I saw this thing of a frame shift. So what you would think would make you happy right now might not be that in three months' time if you're diagnosed with ALS. Do you know what I mean? So your aspirations might be different week to week than what I think I really want now. So it might be to get to that wedding or get to that graduation. It's not for everyone. Um, for some, it's religion. Uh, I saw a patient with ALS um, who was a paedophile and had come out of prison after five years. And he found religion and he said he found, you know, he found something in his life at that point. So I, I think that's probably what I found. And I just end by saying, for me, on a day-to-day -day basis, I've decided no regrets ever. Um, so that's how I kind of live my life, and hopefully that'll lead to a good death. And there's a drinks reception this evening, which might help. You're absolutely a, a right. Good yeah. Regrets issue. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely, absolutely. right. Yeah. Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'd like to talk about other things in some ways. I'd, I'd actually really like to sing at James Blunt's funeral, but that's just an aspiration. <laughs> but I, I, instead, I'm going to go and speak about assisted suicide assistance uh, again. <laughs> Um, it, just in answer to the question, I mean, I, I think are the dying a specific category that we should allow? Um, people to have this assistance at, at the end of life. I think if I was going to be Richard, I'd say, put up your hand, who's not dying in this room? Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're accurate, nobody would put up their hand because we are all dying. That's the whole point. It, it, you know, that's the, the interesting aspect of life. Is it, it, it's worth keeping in mind that it is finite and that we are all dying. And I don't see that, that people in the last stages of life have, have the different moral capacities or different moral issues in many ways than the rest of us. If you look at Oregon, why do people uh, opt for an assisted suicide in Oregon? Um, none of it is, is pain in relation to the disease. It's, it's loss of autonomy, loss of enjoyment of life activities, loss of bodily functions, loss of dignity, and being a burden. Um, and these things can happen to other people. This is why disabled people are very upset at the, the whole notion of assisted suicide is because this, of course, describes many, many disabled people's lives, and yet you can adjust and you can enjoy life at that particular stage. And I don't think that suicide is a good uh, treatment for that sort of um, depression, an understandable depression, but uh, depression nonetheless. And, I, you know, I think uh, interesting... Uh, the question I would ask is, are we in danger of fetishizing dying? Uh, in some ways, it's simply the very end process of living. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, we, we talk about dying all the time, and it's, it's the very end process, and, and 
uh, you know, I, I would wonder whether to, to die happy is to, to have lived a happy life. Maybe that's the way we should be uh, looking at that. That's something that we have much, much more control over, is actually uh, uh, doing something about um, our lives. So I would, I would emphasize that and say that we should actually concentrate on that and just keep in mind that life is finite and to do what we can with the rest of our lives. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll do one very short last round of questions and then I'll ask you just to draw some final thoughts together, okay? Um, Well, I wanted to speak to this issue of um, uh, assisted suicide because I think the people that are uh, advocating it are being a little dishonest because of the point that Kevin made about, well, you know, what's the time frame? Do you have three months to live? Do you have six months to live? Do you have a year to live? And I think the reality is that doctors have always worked informally in terms of people's wishes. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of suspicion of doctors at the moment, but when people get to their end-of-life situation and people are, um, you know, they're in great pain and it's coming to an end, doctors do agree to increase the morphine and to allow people to, um, um, you you know, uh, in, in effect, to die. And I think the, the problem with the, you know, and it begs the question of why do we need the assisted um, dying movement? Um, you know, why does it need to become a campaign? Why does it need to be legislated for when, you know, as I said before, and I think that Kevin's absolutely right, is that it does force people to give up on living. I have a friend who's 91 and um, constant conversations with him about he feels he's a burden, he's worried that he's a burden on his family, uh, and his family absolutely do not feel that. But I think the problem with the assisted dying movement is, number one, it's unnecessary because we have to trust doctors to work informally with families the way they've always done. But most importantly is they give every, you know, they, they create this idea where people give up on life. And then it's not just people who are within the last three months of their lives. It's, you know, as has been pointed out, is people who are depressed, people who have severe disabilities, um, and, and, and people who feel that they are completely dependent. And what type of world are we living in where we want to somehow... Um, you know, focus on this instead of focusing on giving people more meaning in their lives and greater, greater reasons to live. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to contradict one of the two of the things the last speaker said. She said that people advocating assisted dying are being dishonest about the time frame. But doctors have, have found a way to, to predict that six months or less of life is, is, is the case for social care and for accelerated payments through the benefits system for people who are dying. There, is a way, there are ways in which six months or less is it's a, it's an ideal. It's what I would like to see. I'd like to see the law changed, personally. I have personal experience with this in that my brother went to Dignitas And I know, even though I'm not medically qualified, and he was dying of motor neuron disease, I know that he would not have lived more than a very few short weeks, possibly a month, because his breathing was so bad. It was so, so poor. And that, to me, was a good death. He smiled. He was happy when he died, because he was only only 55 when he was dying, but he knew that he had control at the end of his life. He was able to know when it was going to happen and it gave him great comfort to know that it was coming. And the last speaker also spoke spoke about working, doctors working informally with patients. That's so frightening. That really worries me that all of this is happening behind closed doors and without consultation and not publicly. We already know from some work that was done by Clive Seal that about a thousand people a year are helped to die by their doctors quite illegally. This should all be made clearer. After all, the current legislation only allows for conversation about an assisted suicide after somebody has died. That's too late. The main witness is no longer around to answer the question. As a teenager, I rarely think about the way in which I will be dying, and I try not to think about death in general. Um, But I was wondering if anyone on the panel could address if age does or should affect the stigma and opinions around assisted suicide and dying. Um, of the dying, yeah. I mean, perhaps we do want to try and address the the issue of control. And, uh, I mean, it was inevitable that assisted suicide um, was going to be a a big component of this discussion. So whether it's something that other people would like to reflect on uh, alongside Kevin, our assisted suicide expert, as it were, 
but maybe that's um, something that's that's um, worth all of the panel um, reflecting on. So if you don't mind, we'll do it in the same or sure. digits. This is difficult, isn't it? I, I think coming to the point of morphine and so on and turning up the dial, for example, I, I'm not aware of ever being involved in that, but, you know, everyone has their own feelings about that. But I do think that's not the same as making a decision three months beforehand. So you don't get the doctor turning up the morphine four or five months into someone's illness mm. with MND or, or ALS. Um, so therefore, assisted suicide seems to be, or assisted dying seems to be dealing with often a very, very different situation from what you're seeing in the hospital when we're dealing with people who are sort of, by, by some people's definition, terminal. So in the last uh, possible couple of weeks of their lives. Um, so you could argue that assisted dying caters for that. Whether you think it's right or wrong is obviously controversial. Um, the Liverpool Care Pathway, very controversial. We haven't really mentioned it today. Um, it's, it's gone now. Uh, it's not really in practice. But it addressed morphine. How to, uh, it was supposed to address how to use morphine carefully and, and how to use it in the right circumstances. Um, and we don't have that now. I'm not saying it was right by any means, but we're left with a vacuum and we need something. We need something to replace it and make it better. Thank you very much indeed. Chrissy. So I think um, control is obviously a really important issue, and I think I don't have a position either way on assisted dying that I want to particularly get into right now, but I, what I would say is I think the issue of control comes down to a lot of see, remembering that the patients and relatives involved in whatever's going on are, uh, for you know, first and foremost, also people, as are the doctors and the other people so involved. So I think it's about kind of appreciating that People need to be involved as much as they can be. And I think those days of kind of, you know, 1980s, don't tell auntie she's dying and let's just give her the medicine and tell her it's for her colic, you know, are thankfully long gone. But I do think, you know, anything that's this kind of paternalistic, there, there, dear, is horrible. And, you know, people have got to engage with this. Doctors are obliged to at least offer to have these conversations with people about breaking bad news in whatever situation. So I think just trying to kind of keep everyone as involved and informed and ultimately giving the patient the final say is really important. Um, yeah, it's super complicated. Um, I think I'd also just say about the stigma and age. And I think, you know, like, as people have said, dying is part of living. And you, once you're born, you're, you're kind of, you know, obligated to make that. I was reading something at the weekend where somebody used this analogy of taking off in a plane. You know, some people have more turbulence than other people. Some people come down sooner than other people, but we're all going to, you know, at some point we're all going to have to land and we'd like a smoother landing as possible. And I wish I could remember who that was because I think that's a great analogy. So I think that young people are going to be exposed to death, whether directly or indirectly, and hopefully not super early in their lives. But also young people, unfortunately, can be ill and obviously do die. Um, we had someone at school, you know, they died and we, none of us knew what to do. We didn't understand it. But I think that was a really great opportunity for us to all be like, this is going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. This is how we can be with it. Um, and it's uncomfortable and it's sad and it's awkward. But sit with that and just kind of take it on, take it on board and, you know, see it as kind of strengthening you for the future when inevitably you'll be confronted with this in some way again. Um, and I would say, yeah, longer isn't always better with life. So just to bear that in mind and that please... <laughs> Tell people what music you want at your funeral. I've become obsessed with this now. I'm going to be doing it later and telling everyone. Thank you very much indeed. Richard? I'd make the observation that I think assisted suicide will just come. I mean, I've been thinking this for 15 years, that it's, in my mind, it's following a little bit like abortion. For a very long time, abortion was completely unacceptable, but slowly but surely, in most countries or high-income countries, it's become you know, readily available. And I think the same thing will happen with assisted suicide. And I think we see it happening, as we heard. It's just been legalised in California. <clears throat> so I think that's what's going to happen. I also observe that when I talk to doctors, uh, and both the BMJ and the Lancet, before the recent parliamentary debate, came out in favour of assisted suicide, which I think reflects the kind of trend. When I talk to doctors, the thing that bothers most doctors is becoming demented. That's what people don't like the idea of. And a lot of doctors I know have their stash ready that if they think they're beginning to dement, that's the time when they want to get rid of themselves. And I, I sympathise with Kevin's point of view. If you, if you can do it yourself, why not? Although a lot of people can make a terrible mess of it. Um, so... I would, a uh, couple of pieces of, I would, those of you that haven't read Montaigne's essay, To Philosophise is to Learn How to Die, you can find it on the web easily. It's only about five pages long. 
It's the best thing I've ever read on death and dying. And he advocates, like the Stoics before him, the way to deal with death is not to try and push it on one side and never think about it, but actually to think about it all the time. And, you know, be prepared to give way to others as others gave way for you. You know, that's the, the way life is. He also says, be booted, spurred and ready to go. So I urge you to do the same. But his fundamental point, which I think it underlies the whole day here, is that a good death and a good life, they go together. And a life where you try to deny death, never think about it, not be conscious of it, is probably not going to be a good life. Being conscious, this is Kevin and I agree here, being conscious of death, aware of it, remembering it, be prepared for those that you love to die, that is how you find both a good life, I think, and a good death. Okay, I can go along with a bit of that. Although stop talking about it is, is one, of the, one of the key things. I think we can live life and concentrate on that, concentrate on the living part. However, uh, a couple of questions just to, to, to sort of clear up. I mean, I think Jules is right. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I, in, the reason why I oppose assisted legalization of assisted suicide is not to oppose those situations in the last days, hours, um, or weeks of, of life where a doctor takes a, a, a very humane action. I think that's something that uh, happens less and less, but it's still occasionally um, necessary, and, and I have no problem with that. I think the problem comes when you try and legislate and you say, because, you, of course, you, you stop the doctor from taking that action if you legislate, because, of course, then they've got to fill out paperwork and give a two-week cooling-off period, according to the legislation, the proposed legislation. So a doctor can't take a, this, this sort of kind action in that instance, and I think that's, that's an important point to make. And I, I also thought Jules was right about this sort of months ahead of time. A doctor taking a life months ahead of time is taking a life, just the same as you're taking a life years ahead of time. I don't see the, le the amount of time that you have left in your life undermines the moral value in a life, and I think it's just as wrong to take the life of somebody who's, um, you, you know, got six months to live, because any of us, as, as Richard has pointed out, any of us could uh, be walking out of here and die, and the, you've, you've only got, you know, 10 minutes to live, I'm afraid, if that's the case, but uh, taking your life would be, even knowing that, would be just as wrong as taking the, per the life of a 21-year-old. I mean, I don't see that, the, I think moral equality of life, is it's very important to have this moral equality of life, and you can't have it if you define this group with six months or less to live. Why six months? Again, that's another random aspect. You know, to, people suffer from, from uh, all sorts of problems. The other side of six months, this side of six months, this side is suicide, this side, you know, it, it, it doesn't make very much sense. But, I mean, I think to take a group and say, because you've got six months to live or less, you have different moral rules that you follow and we have different moral rules in which we will treat you with. I think that's wrong. And it relates to the question about age uh, and suicide. One thing that you notice about assisted suicide in, in the Netherlands is that there's a great push on to include it for um, the elderly because, of course, they have less time left as well. So why wouldn't their lives be uh, less valuable on the same basis that we, we have this six months to live? So um, there's also... SOARS, uh, Society for Old Age Rational Suicide here, which says that all, all people over the age of 70 should have the choice of an assisted suicide. Why 70 is, is another question. So I think that's, that's interesting. I don't, I don't agree with Richard that um, there is actually um, that the assisted suicide is coming. I think if you look at the United States, there have been 175 attempts to legislate in the United States. And now... Uh, there have been six successes. Uh, this is not like gay marriage, which swept across very, very quickly, uh, or even abortion, which, which swept across relatively quickly. Uh, this has been going for um, 25 uh, years, or you know, a lot longer, actually. So I don't think it's, it's inevitable, and I do think it's something worth resisting. Um, on a good death, I think my grandfather had a very good death, just to end on on this, he was 94, and he was. We played his favorite music at the time. But what's most important is that we felt that was a good death. I don't know exactly what he felt. Uh, it didn't matter after a little while. But we felt that that was a good death, and I think that was the most important aspect of it.
Thank you very much, Kevin.